I put product in my hair for you, and that's not a thing I usually do. I put product in my hair, put product in my hair, put product in my hair for you. Hello, where the mountain goats. If you can see the product, it's a tiny bit. I got all, all dressed up in a t-shirt and uh, the product. Actually, totally, I was in the car. I was like, what if I was just, just brand name, you know, citing every, every you know, a t-shirt, which I am going to do. Actually, that's Record Exchange out of Rochester, New York, a very fine record store. I think one of the guys from Brutal Truth works there. If you're ever in Rochester, uh, you know, one... Still clear of the mayor's wife. I hear she just got busted on a narcotics charge. But uh, but do go to Record Exchange. Record Exchange owns. I am John. We're the Mountain Goats. We're the Merge Records office for the unboxing. I have not seen it yet of the Dark in Here LP. Let's see, it says Merge Records. That proves that we're in Merge and not actually being held captive at an undisclosed underground location. Um, that This, by the way, just in case anybody asks, and they will, this is a, a guild that um, that I got for the uh, for the sessions that produced... Um, getting into knives and this album. I forget which songs on this album I played it on, but I got this. This is the guitar, if you are a total guitars nerd, that uh, uh, is on the cover of uh, Nick Drake's Brighter Later, but it's generally agreed that it is not the guitar that he played, that he never actually played this guitar. But when it came time for the photo shoot, old Nick, who famously was sort of extremely dysthymic, and I guess said, Nick, time for the photo shoot, and he'd be like, okay, well, I'll sit on this chair over here. If you did bring a guitar, no, right? So they handed him the nearest guitar, and it was a Guild, I think it's M40 or M20 is the thing, but he, it's generally agreed that he played a, a Martin. That's today in Nick Drake guitar history. Um, and now on to the next episode, which is uh, the unboxing. This album is called Dark In Here, uh, and um, it is the second, third album in a row. No, if you can't songs with Pierre Chauvin, no. Um, which which we do so um i used to have strong opinions about how albums should not have title tracks so then when we first did a title track i was pretty stoked because it's nice to break your own rules it's kind of like the whole point of the rules is to make one and then take it seriously when you violate it right so um but getting into knives had a title track and leave with dragons had a title track and this one has dark in here which uh seemed really appropriate and then we recorded this in muscle shoals alabama at fame the week after we did getting into knives during that week, and the dates are printed on here, but I have a bad mind for dates. Um, uh, during that week, uh, the state of play on the ground with regard to what we would come to call the pandemic was fluid. Uh, it was dynamic. And, uh, you know, when we, and both Peter and me had, had this terrible, terrible cold um, in January. We were both very, very sick. Um, uh, and, uh, but we mainly recovered by the middle of February in the studio doing the thing. And uh, get down to Muscle Shoals, and the, the news is sort of getting um, getting a little weirder every day. Not everybody uh, was buying into the news cycle, but I was because I used to be a nurse. And when uh, health officials were talking about uh, uh, you know serious viral threats, I, I tend to, to take them seriously. So, uh, But we were locked in the room, right? It was just us. The only time we were really spooked about anything was when a bunch of tourists, like a busload full of tourists who are seeing Fame, which is the studio in Muscle Shoals. If you don't know about Fame Studios, that's where uh, Aretha tracked I Ain't Never Loved a Man. Um, it's where Land of a Thousand Dances was tracked. Um, it's where the Osmonds tracked a lot of their uh, giant hits in the 70s. God, who else? Well, big Dwayne Allman uh, famously camped out in the parking lot there and then got a gig as a session guy. He played a Wilson Pickett's Hey Jude in there. Um, immense records. Oh, uh, Tell Mama. Etta James was recorded in there. You can hear, if you go listen to Tell Mama, and then you go listen to anything on our record, you will hear the room tone, right? Listen to the drums. When you're trying to hear where a place, where a thing was recorded, zero in on the drums. The vocal presence, I stood in what was called the magic spot, which is exactly where Aretha stood when she sang there, which wilded me out because I, I went through, I assume everybody has been through a phase where they discover Aretha Franklin when I was 19. She put out a record called One One God, One Faith, One Baptism, or is it One Lord? One God, one... I, I'm, I'm not... I'm Catholic, so it's a different... <laughs> but uh, 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 one, one God, One Faith, One Baptism was a gospel record. Changed my life. I went out and bought her um, greatest hits and, uh, and, and got super, super into them. When you go through your Aretha phase, it's sort of like when you go through an Otis Redding phase where you just, like, that's the only music that exists, you know, and then it, everything else seems pale next to it and so to be standing literally in the vocal spot where she tracked that it was, it was like, like standing in a, in a great cathedral of, of, of music we also have um 
people who played on some of those records. Spooner Oldham uh, played on those Aretha sides that she tracked down there, and he is on our record. Um, he also toured with Dylan um, on the um, Slow Train Coming tour, which happens to be a favorite Dylan record of mine. And, uh, and we were able to you know, talk to Spooner about, I mean, it's not every day you can ask somebody questions about what it's like to be on the bus with Bob, you know what I mean? Uh, so that was fun. Um, also, Will McFarland plays guitar on it. Been trying to get Will on something for a while. He was in Bonnie Raitt's band a lot in the 80s. And uh, I think he played with um, Ronstead, but I may have that wrong. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, he is a, uh, a session guitarist of incredible power. He's the guy uh, playing that just beautiful slidey guitar in, in Mobile. Um, I can go on a lot about this record because it was a special time for us. We were locked away for six days as the world was sort of, uh, it hadn't contracted yet, but like while we were there, that's when they canceled South By. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then like, you know, I, th I don't think the NBA uh, season had canceled yet, but, but I was like, wow, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money if they cancel South By. That's pretty intense. So that was what was going on into the making of the record. And, and you sort of become a, uh, uh, like a, a bunch of, um, you know, uh, people living in a cave, you know, uh, uh, relying on one another for, uh, for companionship and for, and for support and energy. And it was really cool. Um, all right, let's get some details. Uh, the CD is a four pound. I'm reading these off of the thing. I don't memorize this stuff. I should though. I should be ashamed of myself, right? I should be ashamed. Um, see, it's a four panel wallet includes a 16 page booklet. Uh, I'm not sure what's in there. I didn't uh, actually proof it or okay it. I just said make a 16-page booklet and, and left Leslie to it. So whatever she was thinking about, that's what's no, that's not true at all. I, I, I wrote it. It's mainly the lyrics uh, and 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 some liners. Uh, the vinyl, uh, all variants of the same gatefold jacket, a black paper dust sleeve, and an etching on side D. Uh, standard uh, weight 140 grams. Um, the Spotify fans first edition uh, also comes with a print. I believe that's in this box. We're gonna find out what's in this box, but only off camera, and then I'll tell you what I saw. Again, that's not true. Um, then the peak vinyl, well, let's get it open. Let's, let's set this around. Um, all right, here's the CD in question. Dark in here by the Mountain Goats. Uh, oh man, let's, let's get a little closer look at that. I mean, we'll be looking at the LP momentarily, but that's really hip. I'm kind of really, I was so ornery about CDs when they were new, and I'm kind of really into them now. I, I go on Discogs runs and just buy a bunch of used CDs. Into Joe Ely right now, uh, and uh, Le Super 7. If you ever heard of the Le Super 7 albums, those are great. Um, oh man, it is lovely. This is lovely. We'll look at the bigger version in a minute, but, but there it is, and let's open it up. Boom. First, uh, First Mountain Goats album to have a, a sort of a, a subtitle in a long time. Um, I think the last one was um, The Coroner's Gambit, actually. Uh, Mountain Goats present Dark in Here, 12 songs for singing in caves, bunkers, foxholes, and secret spaces beneath the floorboards. Um, if you find yourself in one of those secret spaces singing these songs, maximum respect. Um, yeah, and there's a, a super fun. Let's look at the actual disc before we go on. Yeah, I, ah, this has got a very nice 80s factory records feel to it. I'm super into it. Um, that is the CD. This is the booklet. Let's go. Oh, it's upside down. Yeah. These are lyrics. I didn't use to print lyrics. It only, it only takes about 20 years of bugging me or people going, would you please print the lyrics? You know, maybe I'm from a country where, you know, English is my first language and I would like to see them or, or maybe I just want to see them. Maybe print the lyrics instead of having, because I had some, you know, a lot of theories when I was younger about, you know, if you don't have the lyrics, then people have to listen to them and learn them. But that's not even true in the internet. You just go, you know, to Lyrics Finder or whatever and find some bad transcription. So they're in here. So uh, here's a merge sticker. I'm pretty sure every mailer, mailer or customer gets at least one merge sticker. Uh, though I can't vouch to that because I'm not here to personally oversee that. But, you know, but we're working on that. Now. Here's a poster of the cover. And then you can see the actual grain. It's a painting. Um, and you can see the grain of that. And there is fun stuff. Let's get to the LP. What else can I tell you about it? Um, there's the black double LP. I guess I should bust them all open. Um, oh yeah, now we're talking. Okay, yeah. Like I say, I'm into CDs right now, but it's kind of hard to argue with a big old 12 inch gatefold, right? So that is nice. That is so nice. Here's the inside. 
I'm sure there's like collectors who are like, why are you cracking the spine? Because I'm not a collector. I play records. Records get beat up in my care. That's what happens because the same with um, my magic cards. They do not go in binders. I play them, right? I have cards I play that would outrage some of you. So you got me a new visit, I'm going to play it. Um, so, so yeah, there's that. And here's the wax. Uh, the black dust sleeve is quite classy. And looks like that. Does it have etchings on the inner groove? Yes, it does. Am I going to read them to you? No, it's unethical to share what it says on the inner groove. That's for people to find out about by themselves. If you type it up on the internet, I will haunt you. It'll be a while before I get to haunt you. you know, I'm in pretty good health, but, but once I get my haunting in, there will be some very serious haunting. I feel very positive about being able to haunt multiple people at once. So um, here's that Spotify uh, print with some dragons on it. Uh, pretty hip. Um, all right, let's get on to the peak vinyl and let's talk about it. Um, the peak vinyl is limited to 5,000 worldwide, 4,999 after I boost this one. Um, it is pressed on high noon somewhere blue vinyl. That's a line from Dark in Here. I'm really proud of the lyrics to Dark in Here. It's, it's just like a, it's a, a sort of a Jonah Hex Western kind of fantasy. And, uh, and I was really happy. It, it felt like, it's not a country song, it's a rock song, but, uh, but the, the first time it gets to the chorus, the line is, it's high noon somewhere, it's dark in here. And I thought, you know, if like, you know, you know who's a great, uh, you know, if, if a great country writer had come up with that one, he would have pat himself a little on the shoulder. I said, I'm pretty, pretty proud of that line. So let's have a look at the, oh, I can already see. If you like colored wax, it's a kind of a great moment where you, you, you see that it's gonna be cool underneath. So, ah, uh, it's marbled, it's got clouds, right? Streaks of cloud in the high noon somewhere, blue vinyl. I, I can feel some of you straining to see what it says in the inner groove, but I will not allow it. So, uh, the haunting, man, the haunting is coming <laughs> 60 years hence. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be an exhausted ghost from all the haunting that I will do. Um, so, uh, what else is true about the peak, the peak vinyl? It's pressed on, on, on blue, and that's what I have. And then, the U.S. Band Store exclusive. This one, you can get from our store, from the Mountain Goat store. It's on Mine Lantern Pale etched vinyl, which is, of course, a conceit, right? It's a color. There is no such color in, in Crayola, uh, you know. Uh, I would say Crayola Pantheon. That's not what I mean. The Crayola Spectrum like pantheon right? all our crayons are gods right? um so uh but you know you want to give your, your wax a cool names ah uh, yeah okay so, oh man so it's a swirl right it's like a it's like a lantern glowing and occasionally giving a little what's it called the uh, little lens flare you know if you were to catch wind of it all of them will look a little different because of the swirl right there's that that there and then if I were to go to the other one, I, we haven't seen the etching yet, so I guess we should look at that. Um, and let's take the U.S. band version to do that. Oh, man, see, totally different. Badass! The etching comes through on the other side in the, in the clear. That is, I'm not going to, to curse because that would be wrong, but uh, it's not allowed in the merge offices. They will find you. It's a cultural thing around here. If you swear, they... You have to, to put five dollars in the swear jar. That's how Christina gets rich, because um, she would never swear. She's very demure. Um, so this etching of the Cola Borehole Tower, right? Uh, the Cola Borehole Tower. I'm gonna tell you the whole story right now. I don't know how long they wanted this video to be, but I hope everybody. I hope your hope your arms feel okay. Fellow with the camera there. So uh, the Cola Borehole Tower was, past tense, was in Siberia. Um, and uh, it was drilling for oil. That's what it was there for, right? And as we uh, continue to, in our madness, to dig for oil, which it's going to run out. <laughs> it is not a sustainable way of living. It's dumb that we're still doing this. But but, uh, but the Soviets were, were, were digging for oil in the hopes of becoming more oil independent. and. If you are going to use oil, theoretically, you should probably want it from your own backyard instead of having to 
to do deals with people. So, so they're drilling, <clears throat> right, as deep as they possibly can. And for a long period of time, the hole at Kola in Siberia was the deepest hole on the earth, right, dug by man, right? It was, there's now one, I think, uh, in the Gulf, uh, near, near Saudi Arabia or something that's deeper, I think. Um, but, uh, but this was the deepest hole in the world. That's the sort of thing that when I hear about it, I say, well, I, I'm, I'm the guy who writes songs for the mountain goats. It's my job to, to, to like that. And I do, and I like my job, and I do like that. So I read up some more about it, right? Um, and, uh, and the Wikipedia entry, I think it was, I was, I was spending one of these mornings where I you know, was casting about, I, got, I was in a hotel room in Seattle, and I was like, oh, this is, I'm pretty into this idea. And, um, I, and I'll, I'll get to how I got to this tower, because I was not like Googling deepest hole on earth, I was, I was looking for something else, but, um, but the last line of, of one mentioned that nobody knows who destroyed the Kola Borehole Tower, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, a lot of the sites that had been maintained by a strong centralized government uh, were no longer, were now in the, in the you know, in the, in, under the auspices of other smaller uh, governments and, and authorities, and, and, you know, the large government could, could oversee a bunch of things at once, but a bunch of other things sort of just went uh, into the sort of chaotic post-Soviet uh, reality for a while, and uh, as far as I understand it, I'm not an expert on uh, geopolitics, <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, so, so it was no longer kept up. Now there's not people, they capped the hole, right? Uh, so that nobody could like, uh, I mean, it was too small for a person to get into, but to prevent people from dropping coins into it, I guess. <laughs> but they capped the hole and they abandoned the tower and, it, and at some point it got destroyed. I like the idea of something that got destroyed that had once been uh, a structure overseeing the deepest hole on the earth and that nobody knows who destroyed it. But the way that I found out about all this was I was trying to determine the origin of uh, an evangelical hoax of the 80s um, that I had read about in the Weekly World News, which I don't think they print anymore. Um, but the Weekly World News wasn't the only place to report on it. Um, it had it, The way that they framed the story of this hole that was being dug was that the, uh, that the, the Russians, it was always the Russians for them, right? Um, that the Russians were... Um, were trying to dig this oil hole and they pierced the vault of hell, right? They pierced the surface of hell. And, and then they recorded, and I love this so much, somebody was on hand, I think this would have been like the early 80s, so they wouldn't have used their phone, they would have had to have brought a tape recorder, right, uh, with a microphone, uh, to record the screams of the damned, right? And then, and then you could hear on Trinity Broadcasting Network uh, and circulating on, as, as a tape if you were haunting, um, you know, uh, Christian bookstores, you could hear the tape that was alleged to be the sound of the damned screaming for mercy in their eternal torment inside the earth, which is fascinating because, uh, you know, depending on what kind of, depending on your cosmology, you probably don't think that hell is inside the earth, but I think Dante did, and I think this is one of those cases where like one of these early framers of the whole question continues to exert incredible influence, just like most of our ideas about demons come down to us from Milton, so that I can have a song called Let Me Bathe in Demonic Light Here, and you're already gonna have a vision of some big, you know, winged angel, and where's that guy come from? Johnny Milton, Johnny Milton, respect, maximum respect to John Milton. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so there was this tape that was reputed to circulate, but again, prior to the internet, you couldn't hear this. You could just read a dumb story about it in some tabloid thing. They say, well, there's a tape of the screams of the damned. You go, oh my God, I need to hear this tape, you know. But then the internet happens, right? And then you can look up the tape online through a 56 kilobit per second uh, connection in Colo, Iowa, and you can hear an extract, now very degraded in real audio, right, if you remember that protocol, um, of this thing. And of course, it sounds like this, oh, no, oh, very terrifying, right? But then because the internet is what it is, some people start going, you know, I bet that's slowed down and possibly reversed, right? And so they, um, so, so they did the work. Somebody put in the work of, of, of analyzing it and, uh, and, and messing with it uh, using who knows what piece of, of software. People who are better at that end of things would probably know off, off the top of their head. This is pre-reason though, so. But anyway, um, they, they go ahead and break it down. Turns out, it's like a 30 second extract from a Hammer horror movie, right? That they had taken and reversed and pitch shifted 
uh, and then claimed it was the sound of the damned screaming in hell from deep beneath the surface of Siberia. Well, again, I'm learning all this on one morning in Seattle on a day off for the Mountain Goats on tour, you know, and I'm like, I got to do something with this. So I wrote the a song called The Destruction of the Super Deep Cold Borehole Tower, probably my favorite song in this record. Um, I'm, I'm really... I'm really happy with the way it came out. It's it's one of the tighter grooves we've ever hit together. Everybody plays on it. Me, Peter, Matt, John, Spooner, and Will all playing at once. Uh, that's that's an exciting thing to to have happen. I mean, it makes you feel when well, you're sitting there trading in with Will and Spooner, you sort of feel like I've you know reached some you know some zenith of existence as a musician. Those guys could really play. Um, so so that's the story of the etching. Uh, which let's let's look at the other copy of it just to blue copy how it come through on there is that yeah very cool let's see if it's I, I suspect the camera will struggle to capture it but i'll tilt it around a little bit um it's really hip feel my, my favorite couplet on that song is uh, solomon in all his glory not arrayed like these bending in the wind like pilgrims on their knees pretty happy with that <laughs> so, i can't wait to play live this is the thing some of these songs i just can't wait to play live and that's one of them um i think that's all i have for you um there's a bunch of other notes about here when we recorded it was march 9th through 14th of fame uh matt ross spang producing john lee gifford assisting shawnee gandhi on the gandhi on the mix again shawnee uh, spectacular job brent lambert right down the street here kitchen mastering uh, uh mastering it in between catching monster waves um vinyl pressed at precision record pressing burlington ontario canada uh, the cover is Walpurgis Night in Bergeslagen, um, or I can't pronounce Swedish well, Grandgarde in Dalarna, by Anselm Schutzberg, 1896, from the collection of the Swedish National Museum. And the design was done by Daniel Murphy, who has absolutely been crushing it for us on the album design. It's really doing amazing stuff. Um, we waited a long time for this. I don't know if I told you, um, I mean, I think the story is out there, but the original plan before the pandemic hit was to uh to announce getting into knives and then on the first night of tour at um uh the 9 30 club in dc there would be a surprise for everybody who was there and it would have been this and i even had a staging idea which i like i'm generally pretty they, they had to restrain me to, to to make us get a backdrop i don't care about staging and i don't care about costumes i don't care about any of that but everybody else likes it so i'm trying to be a, be a good team player <laughs> as born against once memorably said um but uh but I did have this one idea, which would be to open with dark in here with the house lights on, right? And then when I said the chorus line to kill all the lights in the building, I'm certain this wouldn't have passed muster with the fire marshal, but I loved the idea of like right when the chorus hits, everybody's in pitch blackness and then the, and then the lights don't come back up until uh, the lyric is done and then they only come up on stage. Uh, that, was, that was my plan. However, COVID-19, or as my son was calling it a year ago, COVID-19, um, my, I think my favorite uh, iteration of that was when I, I put on uh, um, a WFMU CD that had like um, "Back in Black," but it speeds up every time he says "Back in Black." Uh, and as soon as as soon as uh, my son heard heard Brian Johnson's voice, he said, "Who's that guy? COVID nineteen?" He's pretty stuck with that. So uh, that that's that's today's uh, uh, funny child story. Dads are obligated to tell them, uh, and now I have fulfilled my obligation for the day. Uh, it's weird how when I'm talking to you through the camera now because I haven't had the opportunity to see you from the stage in over a year, I get a tiny fraction of, you know, an inkling of, of how sweet it's going to be when we hit the road on, I think, August 3rd. Um, uh, we're all thinking about it constantly. Uh, we can't wait to see you. I can't wait for you to hear these songs. They're pretty dark. If you're, if, if you're looking for the, the not good songs, they have the extra bit of hope in them. You might want to hang around for the next record or something. These, this is, is a pretty. Most of these songs end with, at best, an ambiguous condition for the narrator, and and uh, and his friends or foes. Uh, so, uh, all right, it was good to spend some time with you. Uh, I assume that there are links and everything um, to uh, uh, to buy the records and so forth uh, here or there or somewhere. Um, was nice to see you. I don't have a song to play you out, but I do have a D minor chord and a G, and you can see the A coming up fifth, coming up fifth, coming up fifth avenue. That's a little music joke because the A is the five and it's coming up fifth. All right, thank you. Good to see you. Bye. <laughs>